या सो जो लोग पार्टिसिपेंट जो है वो अंदर आने से म्यूट हो जाएंगे ना ऑटोमेटिकली नहीं नहीं सर हम म्यूट ऑलरेडी म्यूट है ओके ओके लाइव स्टार्टेड ठीक है ठीक है सर सो आई आई एम स्टार्टिंग एडमिटिंग ऑल द पार्टिसिपेंट्स सर हां हेलो अरुण जी जी कैन आई स्टार्ट एडमिटिंग ऑल द पार्टिसिपेंट्स Yes, sir. You can start, and you can live also now. Okay. professor particle you can start now hello professor particle can you start हेलो प्रोफेसर परिकल कैन यू स्टार्ट professor parikal can you start ah hello hello yeah hello sir yeah please can start sir. yeah yeah very yeah very good afternoon welcome to all our guests and participants it's a great privilege to introduce and welcome one of our most prominent eminent and prominent scholars of translation studies professor mona baker today it's an honor to host her session in india probably for the first time in the history of translation studies mona baker is a professor emerita of translation studies at the center for translation and intercultural <coughs> studies university of manchester uk co coordinator of genealogies of knowledge research network director of the baker center for translation and intercultural studies at shanghai international studies university and honorary dean of the graduate school of translation and interpreting beijing foreign studies university she is a recipient of the 2015 kuwait foundation for the advancement of sciences award in the field of arts and languages <clears throat> languages studies in foreign languages and literatures and honorary of the 2011 fifth session of abdullah bin abdul aziz international award for translation for the contribution to the field of translation baker is as we all know author of many books in other words a course book in translation rutledge 1992 third ed edition 2018 and translation and conflict a narrative account rutledge 
2006 and classic edition in descent voices from and with the <coughs> within the uh, with the egyptian revolution rutledge 2016 which is winner of the intra new uh, linguists of the year award 2015 the rutledge encyclopedia of translation studies which we all of us in uh, all of us actually use uh, uh, which she co-edited with gabriela saldana is published several times 1998 third edition and um, third edition is 2020 uh, 2020 actually okay and um, uh, critical concepts translation studies four volumes she has edited again with rutledge 2009 and critical readings in translation studies rutledge 2010 her articles have appeared in wide range of international journals including palgrave communications social movement studies critical studies on terrorism social semiotics the translator and the target she is founding editor of the translator by saint jerome publishing uh, from 1995 to 2013 she is the formal editorial director of saint jerome publishing from 1995 to 2013 and founding vice president of iatis the international association for translation and intercultural studies she posts on translation citizen media and palestine on her personal website and tweets at mona baker at uh, 11 <clears throat> her article translation as an active uh, alternative space for political action examines the genesis dynamics and positioning of activist groups of translators and interpreters who engage in various forms of collective action the activism of these groups is distinctive in that they use their linguistic skills to extend narrative space and empower voices made invisible by the global power of english and uh, the politics of language she consider translation and interpreting in conflict management situations as a forms of reframing an active strategy that implies agency and by means of which we participate in the construction of reality according to her translator have to prove to themselves as to others that they are in control of what they do that they do not just translate well because they have a flair for translation but rather because like other professionals they have made a conscious effort to understand various aspects of their work this she has written in literary theory and criticism in one of his her articles with these words i warmly welcome professor mona baker and request her to deliver her lecture on narrative analysis in translation and interpreting studies over to professor mona thank you Thank you very much professor Padikal I assume everybody can hear me Rindon am I Yes yes yeah, yeah. Yeah. yeah yeah okay now I'm going to try and share my screen and I've had bad um experiences with that before but hopefully this time it's going to work Yeah uh, let me just one one minute bear with me for a minute right the only thing is now i can't see oh here we are share yes is this all right can you see my screen hello it's fine yes now it's fine, it's fine. It's fine. So, okay um right let's hope it uh, it stays that way Um let me start by thanking professor Padikal and other colleagues and and uh, professor Kundu 
and others for the invitation and uh, my sincere apologies for letting you down last time when the technology just didn't cope. Uh, I hope it will behave itself this time. I seem to have uh, bad luck with technology generally, but but hopefully this one will will uh, will go smoothly. Um, I, uh, as you can see, the the topic of my uh, lecture is uh, on narrative analysis in translation and interpreting. This is a fairly theoretical contribution, but I will be doing my best to make it as concrete as possible. Um, but it's not specific to uh, narrative analysis uh, of the type that I have tried to elaborate. It's not specific to a specific genre, for example, to literary translation. It's not specific to a particular setting, so it's not about uh, interpreting in hospitals and so on. It is, it's really uh, a general framework um, that is not even restricted to translation studies, although it has important implications in translation. It's a theoretical framework that uh, has informed research in many other uh, disciplines, both in the humanities and the sciences. And in fact, I would be making a point of uh, referring to uh, similar assumptions built on narrative theory in uh, medical research to show that uh, this is not uh, something that is specific to the humanities even. So I set out to elaborate this uh, particular uh, theoretical framework more than 15 years ago. It's uh, kind, kind of relatively old now, uh, but it seems to have captured the imagination of uh, many scholars. And there have been many case studies. If you decide you're interested in the uh, type of analysis that I will be talking about, you will find now many examples of case studies that uh, put it into good use. Uh, I think it's uh, it's captured the imagination of people because simply because it resonates with everybody's everyday experience of life. It doesn't require mastery of much technical jargon, but having said that, I'm afraid it is deceptively simple because a lot of people uh, get enamored by it because it's simple, it's, uh, it's accessible, it uh, reflects the way they um, experience life on a daily basis, um, but that doesn't mean that it's easy to apply. And it's not easy to apply, not because it is difficult really, but because we have built up over many years of doing research, a way of doing research that is very much at odds with this theoretical framework. We are used to um, there's nothing wrong with it, but it's a different way of doing research. We are used to uh, following kind of templates, uh, a set of uh, categories that uh, you can look for in data and then follow a template, an orderly structured template uh, to uh, make sense of the data that uh, you have. Um, the, the narrative analysis doesn't work that way at all. It is, doesn't work by following templates or applying a set of categories. It, it assumes that translation is only one aspect of um, our daily life experience and that like all other aspects of our daily life experience, we make sense of it, not by applying templates, but by engaging with it quite actively. Um, I'll, I'll give you examples of that, so don't worry about it too much at the moment. We don't, but, but basically, we don't follow a template in order to make sense of what people are telling us. We don't stop and say, okay, this person has given me a, this account of events. I'm going to break it down into uh, this set of categories and then add them up and see where, where we end up with that. Uh, as I go through the uh, explanation of the theory and elaboration of uh, examples, I will uh, highlight issues of methodology and the kind of research questions that you can ask using this uh, type of framework, and I'll try and make it as accessible as possible. Okay, let me start with the basics and then move on from that. Uh, as far as the basics are concerned, the core concept that uh, this theory revolves around is, of course, narrative. And uh, in very, very simple terms, narrative is a story. Uh, we're all familiar with stories. We tell them and receive them all the time. It's a story that unfolds in time, and it has a perceived beginning and a projected end. The perceived and the projected bits are very important because 
the assumption in this theory is that there is no natural beginning for any story you tell. There is no natural or uh, reliable end to it. Uh, our experience is doesn't have borders. It doesn't get um, it. We, we, it doesn't happen in chunks with clearly defined borders. So when you tell a story, you have to decide when, from your perspective, where you should begin. Um, uh, somebody else may begin earlier, may begin later with the same kind of story. And even when you don't know how the story is has ended, uh, if it's something in the future, you project an end to it. If you carry on doing this, um, if you carry on smoking, you're going to de possibly develop lung cancer or whatever. We are projecting these ends. They may never happen, but we project them. Uh, secondly, uh, and importantly, uh, narrative in this sense um, is constructed by any narrative, is constructed by numerous agents, many agents. There's no such thing as a narrative that is totally under the control of one individual or one institution. Everybody uh, contributes to um, elaborating a variety of narratives and even your narrative of yourself. I mean, each of us has a story of ourselves in our minds, who we are, what we stand for, uh, why we did certain things. Even that is not your own because other people uh, story you, other people, uh, tell stories about you and these stories that they tell about you become part of your narrative because they uh, influence the way other people think of you and they travel back to you and influence your sense of self. So it's very important within uh, this uh, uh, framework to appreciate that narratives are not under the control of any one person or institution even though some institutions may become so powerful that they control the narrative for some time, but there's always scope for, for resistance, that's important. Narratives are populated by a variety of participants, uh, both real or imaginary, so participants uh, are not necessarily protagonists in the literary sense, um, uh, they may be human or non-human, and importantly, they are in a configured relationship with each other and with the unfolding narrative. And so, for example, the example I like to give only because it's very basic and it, and it gets us away from the idea, the literary idea of narrative as populated by characters uh, in particular types of relations. If you think of the narrative of climate change, uh, and when I say narrative of climate change, I don't mean a single narrative. There are many conflicting narratives. That's part of the theory. When you think of the narrative of climate change, that narrative is populated not just by people by us, like us, whose behavior, whether we use deodorants, whether we take too many flights, influences um, the, the rate of change in the environment, but it's also populated by uh, something, things like uh, the ozone layer, a very important uh, participant in that narrative. The ozone layer is influenced by our behavior, but it also what we do and the way it, it, in which it influences our own behavior ultimately also influences us, impacts us, because it makes changes in the environment in which we live. So this is a typical example of a narrative that shows how all the participants in a narrative, in this case, human beings, uh, planes, uh, deodorants, uh, uh, ozone layer, uh, and so on, all the participants in the narrative are in a configured relationship to each other and uh, they are influenced by each other and each other's behavior. And that's typical of what happens in the world with our relationships, for instance. Uh, importantly, again, narratives are realized in various media and by disparate means of in, uh, expression. This is important because we have a tendency uh, traditionally in translation studies to uh, privilege textual material. Uh, this is no longer tenable anyway, even without a narrative framework, because as we know, uh, the balance uh, between uh, textual and non-textual media in the way we receive information and, and narratives has shifted quite um, radically in, in more recent years. Um, we've never actually just received uh, information and stories through uh, textual material only, but the, the, the uh, balance has now 
shifted uh, quite a bit. So this theory suggests that you cannot privilege um, any kind of uh, one media, including textual material, if you're going to work with narrative. So you have to think of unlimited range of media going even beyond the ones that we're familiar with, we, we tend to talk about as media. So uh, not just spoken and written material, kinesthetic, pictorial, music, for instance, I mean, that's not new. A uh, lot of people understand that music uh, makes a, um, a very important contribution to the development of a narrative, for instance, in a film, the type of music that's being played. But color, layout, costume, the way people are uh, dressed in theater or in, in films, for example, tells you something about uh, when the events are taking place, uh, what kind of class this person comes from, uh, and so on. Uh, but importantly, going beyond that, because we, that's not something we tend to think of as media, in the case of translation, and I will show you examples of this, you also have patterns of selection, um, including the selection of source and target languages. I'll show you examples of that. And even something like the directionality of translation, whether translation happens from one language into another language uh, in one direction only or bi-directional or within a range of languages um, mixed together, all that has implications for uh, the kind of narrative that's being elaborated. And again, as I said, I will uh, show you examples of that. Now, importantly, an assumption that uh, is shared by many scholars who uh, work with narrative theory today is that uh, stories are the, the, the stories we live uh, by and that we you, we um, uh, we by means of which we make sense of the world are not uh, and cannot be direct representations of the world. They are not uh, truthful accounts um, as such. They are not objective accounts of events. And that's why we need um, something like uh, the concept of narrativization. I'll come back to that in a minute, but before I do, I want to show you an example um, of uh, how the combination of different uh, media and layout can contribute to uh, your understanding of a narrative. And then I'll come back to the issue of narrativization. Um, this is a very simple example, uh, a well-known book in translation studies, a very good book, Gender in Translation. Um, where Sherry Simon talks about uh, how the, the role of gender and how uh, you, you um, deal with it in, uh, and how translational choices impacts uh, on issues of gender in society. Now, if you are familiar, and that applies to any uh, kind of narrative, if you are familiar with the codes with, with which a narrative is elaborated, you will make a lot of sense of that uh, cover even before you get to read the book. So the broader narrative is of course elaborated in detail in the book itself. But once you look at that cover, and if you understand that in certain cultures, including the cultures from which the uh, author comes, in those cultures, pink stands for female and blue stands for male. So that's why in, in many Western countries, babies are dressed in pink if they are female, if they're girls, and dressed in blue if they are males. Uh, so note the distribution of color. You have the issue of layout, not just the choice of color, but also the layout. You can see very clearly that uh, here blue, or the male experience, if you like, um, uh, is taking up a, a lot more space than the pink. So this before you even read the book, um, you can, this is part of the narrative, both the color and the distribution, the layout are already helping you make sense of the narrative are part of, uh, of how the narrative is elaborated. Uh, but going back to the issue of the fact that uh, in this theory, uh, narratives do not uh, represent the world. They are they constructed or mediated, but they don't represent it as it is and can't represent it as it is. We need another concept, which is concept of narrativization. Uh, very simply, narrativization is the process we engage in when we give a set of events the structure of a story. 
And we have to engage in that process because, because as Hayden White, the historian says, real events do not offer themselves as stories. It is because of that, that their narrativization is so difficult. If real events offered themselves as already constructed stories for you, then people would not disagree about these events and what they mean. I want to show you that this is, uh, although it may be a problematic uh, concept for some people, the idea that there is no ultimate truth, absolute truth, there's no, or at least not an absolute truth we can grasp without the mediation of narratives. There's no total objectivity. Um, this uh, is from a, a report submitted to the World Health Organization uh, by, um, let me just, I've got a banner here that's kind of interfering, fine. Um, uh, submitted to the World Health Organization uh, about the use of uh, narrative methods of research in medicine. And as you know, medicine is as probably as hard a science as you get. Uh, people need to be, um, to adopt scientific methods in, in, in methods which we can negotiate in the humanities. But even, even here, uh, people are very clear, or at least some people are very clear here that the report to the World Health Organization says, even when based on real events, no story is an objective version of the truth. Although importantly, the same might be said of a set of numbers or survey responses. So here, the assumption is that stories are not just told in the familiar way in which that we associate with stories. Everything ultimately is a story. Even a set of numbers tells a story. And we actually say this in kind of everyday uh, life. We say, you know, each, each um, set of accounts tells a different story about this company, for example. Um, one person's story told twice is never the same uh, because the person changes, the temporal setting changes. So stories are not uh, direct accounts of, uh, of the truth. Uh, they are different for different people and different people tell different stories about the same event. That's quite important uh, uh, if you accept that, that might be difficult for some people to accept, but it's a basic assumption in narrative theory. And it's important uh, for translation. It has implications for translation because the implications are that an analysis, one implication, for instance, is that an analysis of or typical analysis of what goes on in translation studies, you have a source text, you have a target text, you compare the two and you come up with some discussion of usually differences. Uh, we look for differences. We don't look for similarities uh, uh, of what is going on in the text. Now, any attempt to do this that focuses on uh, what the analyst uh, decides are misunderstanding or misrepresentations of the source text, or uh, typically in the old days, we used to call the source, the source author's intentions um, on the assumption that there's some kind of reality that is uh, assumed to be depicted, depicted in the source text and that that reality that is in the source text is stable, doesn't change for different people, for different readers, and that you as an analyst has some kind of privileged access to that reality and can uh, make um, kind of reliable um, statements about what is right and what is wrong in, in the target text. If you limit yourself I mean, I, I, can, I can imagine there are sometimes very glaring um, um, misunderstandings or be, perhaps because of lack of uh, linguistic competence on the part of the translator. But, but really that is not kind of coherent with narrative theory. That's not the kind of analysis you would want to do in narrative theory because it's an analysis that assumes that you already know that you already know the truth you, and you have objective understanding of the author, source author's intentions and of a single reality that is being depic depicted in, uh, in the narrative. Um, so uh, importantly then, and as the uh, WHO WHO report goes on to say, um, that given that you cannot follow templates in order to, uh, to uh, assign features of the text or, categ or categories derived from the theory. And so um, we have to think creatively if we're going to work with narrative theory, we have to 
accept that we as analysts do not have direct access to a single uh, account or the single interpretation of a narrative and that uh, any narrative we look at and try to dissect cannot be just measured against some standard of truth that we have access to categorically. Um, I think that the, uh, the, 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 let me just go back this. Um, okay, so narrative analysis does not lend itself, this is the main thing you have to remember, and I will try to show you examples of how that works, that narrative analysis does not lend itself to uh, templates uh, or the uh, kind of mechanistic application of mapping up of a set of categories with, uh, with data. Uh, so I'm going to go on, on and give you actually some of those categories, some of those tools of analysis, but the assumption is that you are not going to be able to apply them by following a template um, uh, cate categorically in order to, uh, to make sense of them. Um, just to give you an idea, this would be the kind of analysis that you do here would be in this respect, very, very different from um, the kind of analysis that you do if you're applying descriptive translation studies. In descriptive translation studies, which is one of the most popular uh, theoretical frameworks ever in translation studies, and part of, the of its popularity, not, not the only reason, but uh, it's very strong in, in, many, in many ways, but part of its popularity was the fact that it provided you with a, a template that you could follow in order to uh, um, offer a, a detailed analysis of the text you were looking at. And so in, in DTS, in descriptive translation studies, you had, you, you were told you could start with um, saying something about the initial norm, adequacy versus uh, acceptability. Then you move on to uh, preliminary norms, which cons consisted of uh, saying something about the choice of source and target uh, languages, uh, the policy of translation, and the directness of translation, whether, for example, indirect translation, mediated translation uh, through another language was or was not uh, acceptable at the time, and, and why, and with what implications. And then you moved on to uh, operational norms, matricial norms, whether bits of the text were omitted or added, and, and then actual textual uh, linguistic uh, norms. And there you have a template that you could follow and a set of categories that you could apply fairly unproblematically. That is not going to happen with narrative analysis. So if you if you are wedded to this kind of analysis, you will find uh, narrative analysis very difficult. But hopefully, um, I will give you some uh, hints about how you might apply it without without this kind of difficulty. Okay. So first of all, we can to start with some uh, simple um, uh, categories, if you like, um, which um, first the types of uh, narrative, if you want to start uh, looking at this more deeply and to make sense of what goes on, the kind of narratives that you produce and digest in, uh, in life and their implications for translation, um, we can distinguish, for instance, between personal narratives uh, these are stories of the self or of an individual. These are the stories you tell of yourself uh, and others tell you about themselves uh, on a kind of daily basis. But uh, in relation to translation, they are very important in if you're translating uh, autobiographies, uh, various kinds of testimonies, including testimonies in court, what you yourself uh, as, a, as a, a witness, for instance, um, uh, witnessed um, and, and thought happened. Uh, witness accounts, eyewitness accounts in, um, for instance, conflict zones uh, where journalists talk to people about what they actually saw. And uh, these are all personal narratives. The outcome of that is personal narrative where an individual rather than a set of events is at the center of the narrative, their own experience. There's a uh, there's a lot of overlap among these things. So remember, these are not categories to be applied rigidly. Rigidly, they are ways of helping you think through 
um, the idea of uh, narrative and narrative, narrative analysis. Uh, public narratives are shared stories, typically the kind of stories that you hear in the media, um, that you might exchange uh, within the academy, for instance, about what's going on here in uh, at Dower University, what's the latest news and so on. These are shared among uh, many people without necessarily an individual being the center uh, or the narrating individual being the center of the narrative. There is an overlap because you can also have a public narrative, of course, of uh, one person's life, like Nelson Mandela for, Mandela, for instance. So there is overlap. There's always overlap. Conceptual narratives are uh, expert na narratives, if you like. And uh, they're the types of things that we don't naturally think of narratives, but within this particular version of narrative theory, they cons constitute narratives. Um, so uh, a very obvious example is the theory of evolution. That theory of evolution has a very, very clear narrative um, structure actually about how evolution happened. But even something like, uh, to take something you would be familiar with, some, something like Scopus theory in um, translation studies. Now Scopus theory, you think this is just a theory, but if you dig into it, there are lots of assumptions, narrative assumptions about what the world is like. So Scopus theory rests on concepts such as commission, rests on the assumption of prof professionalism. So it, uh, it uh, elaborates a story of the world in which translation happens a particular narrative of that world. It's a narrative that is populated by professional translators. So people like volunteer translators, for instance, don't come into the theory at all, although they exist in the world. And we know we can tell different narratives about translation that would feature volunteer translators. Um, uh, uh, it's populated by professional uh, translators who are well-trained, uh, very confident young men and women who are able to sit down with uh, customers clients, uh, get a clear, coherent commission from them. These clients are, uh, are sensible, coherent, uh, cooperative. They provide commissions. And um, everything proceeds fairly smoothly. And then they produce this professional translation based on the commission. Now, that does not, that's a narrative that excludes, for example, um, uh, untrained uh, translators who work in conflict zones where people are shooting at them. They're not giving them commissions, they're shooting at them, they're scapegoating them and so on. So every, every kind of theory rests on some assumptions about what the world is like that you can tease out and you can look at it from a narrative perspective. So these would be conceptual expert um, narratives. Um, Finally, meta narratives are uh, narratives or shared stories that are like public narratives, but they have extensive temporal and spatial appeal and reach. They, these are the narratives that persist over many generations. Typically, religious narratives are meta narratives, and we're still living with uh, the narrative of Buddhism and of Islam and of Christianity today. And uh, they, they influence an awful lot of people over a very long period of time. Now, I, uh, globalization, of course, is a very powerful uh, narrative that is still with us and the concept of progress. Um, but war on terror might be a little bit un unusual for some people. I consider it, a, um, different people will consider different things, public narratives or meta narratives, but I consider it a meta narrative, despite its very short, relatively short uh, lifespan. I mean, that doesn't go back as far as Christianity, for instance. Uh, but it, within a short period of time, it has grown tremendously to be familiar to just about everybody that lives anywhere in the world. And everyone that lives anywhere in the world is influenced by it. Uh, they can feel its impact every time you go through security in an airport. This is an outcome of the narrative of the war on terror. So these are uh, types of uh, narrative that, um, uh, that you can work with. And I'll give you an example of how I worked, I mean, how I applied this um, um, to, to make sense of translational uh, material. So some time ago, uh, back in 2014, 2015, 
uh, I uh, got a fellowship to study uh, the role of translation in the Egyptian revolution uh, of 2011, 2012. And uh, I decided to focus on two collectives who were very uh, heavily involved in producing material and getting it translated and uh, distributed worldwide in order to give people outside Egypt in particular uh, an idea of what was going on in Egypt and, uh, um, and different aspects of it. And they were particularly working against uh, the dominant view of uh, the revolution in uh, international media. So one of these collectives was called Words of Women in the Egyptian Revolution. Uh, and what they did was they went around um, talking to individual women, of course, they selected them. They found women, different kinds of women who were uh, involved in the revolution in one way or the other. And they asked them, they interviewed them, of course, in Arabic, these are Egyptians, so they speak Arabic. They interviewed them in Arabic and asked them to tell their story, how they got involved in the revolution, uh, uh, what they make of it, uh, uh, and so on. Um, now, I've put uh, here um, photographs of many of the women who, uh, who were interviewed, not all of them, but many of the women who were interviewed. And basically, the, uh, um, I don't know what happened. You share it again, madam. Sorry? Share it, share it share again. It? Yeah, okay. Share it. Okay. How how far did we, did we get? Could you hear me? Could you hear me or is it just the screen? Yeah. I can see you. I can see you. Okay. We can hear you. Yeah. So now now you can see it? Yes, ma'am. Okay. So, uh, okay, so this yeah. is the, um, you, you, uh, you got the types of narrative and I'm, I'm going to give you an example of how I, I used that typology to make sense of, uh, uh, of work I did on the Egyptian revolution. Now this collective words of women from the Egyptian revolution, as I said, went around interviewing uh, various types of uh, women who were involved in the revolution and asked them in Arabic to give their account of what was going on and how they got involved. The idea was to challenge the uh, <clears throat> dominant narrative, patriarchal narrative of the revolution as having been led mainly by men and uh, men were very much at the forefront of uh, media coverage. So this was a, an attempt to show that women had a very important role to play and they were just as involved as men. So it was an anti-patriarchy kind of narrative, but it was more than that, when I actually watched all those videos and looked at the different kinds of women that they interviewed, it was also a, a, a narrative that used individual personal narratives of these individual women in order to tell a story of diversity. That's how I interpreted a story of diversity, inclus inclusivity, um, and um, I can't see my slide and complexity. So if you look at these women, for example, you will see even without uh, listening to, if, if you listen, uh, these, these interviews were translated into English, into Spanish, into a whole range of languages. You look at their um, pictures and even without listening to their stories, you can tell that they are very, very different. They are old, they are young, they are devout, uh, even fundamentalist, if you like, wearing niqab, they are uh, veiled, they are non-veiled, they are uh, very secular. And when you listen to the stories, uh, you know they are Muslims, they are Christians, they are from different parts of the country, they are black, they are white, uh, and so on. They are radical, they are more kind of part of the highly educated, some highly educated, some not educated at all, and it shows in the kind of language and, uh, and what they say. So this is a, a story about the diversity uh, of uh, Egyptian society, not just about anti-patriarchy. And it's also about its inclusivity. So you notice, for instance, uh, this one here uh, in the middle, this is a, a mother and her daughter interviewed together. And uh, 
you can see from the interview and even from just looking at the picture that the mother is unveiled, but the girl is, the, the daughter is, uh, is veiled. And this is indirectly tells you something about the way in which people with different faith, um, as opposed to the common narrative in the media, live even within the same household and coexist and uh, are happy to be different and still living in the same household. So it's a, a story about the diversity, inclusivity, and complexity of Egyptian society. Now, when you look at the actual translations, you notice certain things that they're not errors, but they are choices that have had an impact on that narrative, on that broader narrative that I, that I identified. So for instance, a very important um, feature of the way in which some, only some of the women the highly educated women who were uh, interviewed, uh, uh, feature of the, uh, the, the way in which they talked is that some of them code switched a lot between Arabic and English. These are the highly educated women who went to private schools and learned English and uh, got used to the idea of moving between English and Arabic all the time. So uh, it doesn't show in the uh, English subtitles, but uh, I can assure you the same thing happens in the Spanish and the rest. I'm using the English subtitles because it's a language we share. Um, but here, for instance, this girl says, so it was a bit reassuring and I decided to participate a day before the protest. Of course, she says all this in Arabic, not in English, but reassuring she uses in English. Similarly, her mother says, I felt it was a sort of a joke, not that I took it lightly, sort of a joke she actually says in English, okay? Now, in the English subtitles, this could have been italicized, for instance, to draw attention to the fact that this is a borrowed term. In the Spanish um, um, subtitles, uh, you don't get any kind of code switching signaled at all. So the entire subtitles are in Spanish. What do you lose here? It's not a question of errors or not errors. What you, you lose here from my perspective as somebody who's re-narrating um, this, um, this story, what you lose is the, uh, the kind of diversity that the collective that conducted the interviews tried very hard to build into the overall narrative of, of how women were involved in Egyptian society and of Egyptian society. What they were trying to say, part of what they were trying to say is it wasn't just the intellectuals, it wasn't just the educated people who were involved in the revolution. Some of them were highly educated, but also a variety of different people of different faiths, of different uh, social backgrounds also took part. Now you lose that distinction when you lose these kind of um, nuances, um, such as code switching, because then these women sound the same as the much less educated women that are interviewed. So that's one way of kind of um, making sense uh, of, of, uh, of um, minor nuances of changes in uh, translation that have ramifications for the overall narrative. It's not a question of wrong or right, it's a question of how these choices influence the way we receive the narrative and how the narrative develops in another language. And notice here that, again, this is a very typical uh, of the kind of narrative al analysis that you might want to conduct, is that the individual personal narratives are used collectively in order to elaborate a broader public narrative about uh, Egyptian society. So these, the boundaries between the two are not, uh, sep are not clear and um, the interplay between personal and pu public narratives is one of the most um, uh, promising productive areas of uh, research using narrative theory and translation. Okay. Let me give you another set of categories, tools that again, you're not gonna be able to kind of separate and work with um, in, a, in a template uh, mechanistic type of fashion, but it, they help you think through uh, the idea of narrative and, and how you might use it to make sense of translational material. Um, they, this set has to do, um, there are only some of the dimensions of narrative that I elaborated in several publications, but they will suffice to make the point. These are dimensions or core features of narrative, of how narratives function, how 
they work, whether they are public narratives, personal narratives, conceptual narratives, these are important aspects of, uh, of narrativity, if you like. So I, I will first uh, give you a, a very brief definition of each, and then I will show you concrete examples of what this means uh, in relation to translation specifically. Uh, the first is temporality. It's very obvious. Uh, narratives are always set in time and place, and the time and place in which they are set and in which they are read or uh, heard uh, contributes to the meaning of the overall narrative. Selective appropriation, again, very easy to understand. You can never tell a narrative by uh, including absolutely every detail in it. You always have to, I mean, appropriation has a slightly negative tone, but that's not intended. It, it, I, mean, I don't mean selective appropriation in the sense that uh, somebody willingly and, and um, cynically leaves some information and out in order to influence people. That happens, of course. But uh, I'm saying that there is no such thing as narration that does not involve selective appropriation, because there is no way in which you can build in every detail of everything that has happened in relation to an event. For example, you want to narrate to somebody else. If you did, you would end up with a completely incoherent account, and people would be bored and wouldn't listen. So that happens anyway. Relationality of parts basically means that um, any element, uh, and it doesn't have to be a textual element, it could be a character, it could be anything, any element of a story that is told accrues value from being part of that story. It, so it, over and above its semantic meaning, you have to think of how it's configured within that story and what it means within that story. And I'll, again, I'll give you um, some examples of that. And finally, causal implotment is really what all this builds up to. It's the most important aspect of narrativity. It leads to what Hayden White calls closure, uh, uh, the sense that the whole point of the narrative is how things are configured in relation to each other, how they are implotted, and the kind of conclusion, if you like, you end up with when you hear a narrative. So you've told me a story. So whose fault was it? Who did what? Why? Why did they do it? Um, could it have been done better? Whose fault? Who's responsible for this? This is the kind of causal implotment of things in relation to each other so that they add up to a narrative, usually with a, a moral message or some kind of message that you take away from it. Okay, so uh, let me start with example of temporality and what that means in translation. Uh, some of you may be familiar with uh, the name uh, Milan Kondera. He's a very well-known Czech novelist. Uh, one of the reasons he's kind of known within translation studies in particular is that he's had many arguments with translators. He's been very negative about translations of his work into English at least. Um, um, I think he writes in French, he's Czech, but he writes in French. So one of uh, the bad experiences he had um, uh, is with uh, the first translation of uh, a very well-known book by, by him called The Joke. Now, The Joke uh, is a very interesting uh, book. Um, I recommend it if you want to read uh, something um, very enjoyable. It's a, it's a, it's a novel that's uh, recounts the same set of events, but three times, each time from the perspective of one of the characters involved in the story. Okay, so it's the same story, but uh, you, 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 of course, it's never the same story when people, different people uh, say, uh, tell it, but it's, uh, it's the same set of events being more or less recounted uh, in three different ways by three different um, characters. Uh, the translators of uh, the first translation of the joke uh, were David Hamblin and Oliver Stalibras. And according to uh, Piotr Kuczak, who analyzed the translation and uh, uh, Milan Kondera's responses and uh, complaints about the translation, what the translators did is they, from their point of view, they saw that the lack of strict chronological order in the book uh, was misleading. And so they decided to introduce chronology by cutting, pasting, and shifting the chapters around. 
they decided to prioritize chronological order. So you ended up not with three perspectives on the same set of events. They thought that repeating it, repeating the same set of events was boring and um, they would alienate the reader. Uh, they just uh, recounted it without the three perspectives, just as a set of events. What, so what, what Milan Kundera, of course, objected to, and what happened here in terms of temporality, is that what was a very polyphonic narrative about the ambiguity and complexity of human experience ended up being a simple story about a set of relations between a set of characters and what happened. So it kind of divested the story of its the entire message of the story, which was about the ambiguity and complexity of human experience and the fact that different people experience the same set of events in very different ways. Temporality is also very, very important in the context of interpreting, particularly interpreting in uh, legal contexts. Uh, and one of these legal contexts is the asylum system where uh, I don't know whether I don't know whether you have it in India or not, but certainly in many parts of the world, you have a system that is supposed to protect uh, refugees and asylum seekers who have been prosecuted uh, perse persecuted uh, in other places, uh, who have been traumatized in one way or another, uh, raped, uh, tortured, for example. So uh, the problem. The problem with this system is that there are certain institutional requirements uh, that is also true of uh, court systems everywhere. When uh, somebody, uh, a defendant, for instance, or a witness uh, recounts what they saw or what, what they, uh, their, their account of, uh, of events, the court or the asylum um, caseworker expects a rigid temporal structure. They expect you to tell the story in the right kind of order in order for it to be coherent. But that is a problem. It's a big problem because first of all, even without trauma, even without torture and rape and so on, uh, this is not what happens in from the perspective of lived experience. If, if somebody asks you to tell a story, uh, if I start telling you the story of my life, I will weave forth back and forth between events based on their relevance, on what I remember when, and so on. So this is, it's not at all unusual for people to tell stories, to give accounts of what they saw or what happened or what they experienced, uh, not in chronological order, but in a, in a different kinds of structure depend on the kind of coherence they see in that story. But this is really intensified in the case of trauma, because when somebody is traumatized, not only do they not necessarily remember things in the kind of correct order, but sometimes they also uh, can't talk about certain things or they can't uh, remember uh, particular details because they are tra traumatized. And so even in medicine, because medical officers have to deal, of course, with uh, some of this stuff, um, you have, for instance, Greenla saying, um, that while specific detailed memories are viewed by the legal system as more credible, people with depression, not even trauma, just depression, uh, or tra traumatic past tend to produce memories that are vague and lacking in detail. And hence a coherent, consistent account of persecution is unlikely, particularly in the most traumatized. So that's kind of scientifically proven. It's not, it's not something that um, the court or the legal system should dismiss as uh, somebody just being insincere uh, or trying to uh, gain um, uh, asylum status because they are uh, liars and there's nothing wrong with them and they should just go back to their country, which tends to be what they assume. The, what is the responsibility of the interpreter or in this case also the medical officer because we're talking about people in similar positions where they have to mediate that non-chronologically ordered narrative, um, that narrative that weaves back and forth and misses details and so on, they have to mediate that for an institutional system that requires chronological order and re requires temporal uh, discipline, if you like. As far as Robert Barsky is concerned, who worked on the interpreting side of things, he thinks that 
Interpreters can help redress the wrongs of the convention refugee system to some extent, but in order to do so, they have to be allowed to work as intercultural agents rather than translation devices. From Barsky's point of view, and this is a view shared by some but not others, and there are, of course, complications and, 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 and ethical dimensions that you have to bear uh, in mind, but from the point of view of some people, the, in this case, the interpreter has to be able to mediate that experience for the institution in order to protect the already traumatized um, asylum seeker, refugee or whatever. Uh, in, so they have to inject some element of coherence into what is told in a very incoherent way. Otherwise, that asylum seeker who was already traumatized might have been tortured, raped and so on, has no chance at all. Similarly, in medicine, um, the same argument has been made. And so Greenlaw says in asylum applications in which the victim's own narrative is unforthcoming or untrustworthy, the responsibility for constructing a credible narrative increasingly falls to the medical examiner. As I said, you may disagree with that, but uh, a lot of people think that that kind of the temporality of the narrative, the fact that there is a... Um, there is a, a tension between institutional requirements and human experience in terms of how narratives are um, told, experienced, recalled, that has to be mediated somehow. Otherwise, uh, people don't really stand a chance. They're already traumatized and they, uh, they, they will be subject to further traumatization, further injustice, if no kind of mediation is introduced at all. Uh, Okay, um, we move on to another um, dimension. So temporality was the first dimension I talked about, selective appropriation. Now selective appropriation at its very basic uh, level, you'd be talking about something similar to what's called matricial norms in descriptive translation studies, which is omission or addition of stretches of text. But that would be easy to identify, so I'm not going to give you examples of that. What is more interesting, it's, it's not just about omission and addition of textual material, but also about omission of certain dimensions of uh, or characteristics of uh, the narrative or the way the narrative is told, the foregrounding a backgrounding of certain elements. So this example comes from, uh, not from a scholarly publication, and actually some of the most interesting analysis of translations um, is often um, published in non-scholarly uh, outlets. This one comes from the New Yorker, and it's about uh, the translations of Jalaluddin Rumi in the United States. Uh, Rumi, as some of you will know, was um, uh, a key well-known uh, 13th century Persian poet who was also an Islamic scholar. And uh, he's been translated in, uh, by several people uh, in uh, the US, um, and he is extremely popular now. Extremely popular, but that is due to uh, a particular translation by Coleman Barks uh, that Ali comments on in this uh, very interesting article in The, the New Yorker. Um, now, you could, if you were applying uh, Lawrence Venuti's um, uh, model, for example, of domestication and uh, foreignization, you would call this just simply a domesticating uh, translation. It is highly domesticating, but I want to go beyond that and say, and, and say that the concept of selective appropriation can help you also tease out the wider implications here. So uh, the example, one of the examples that uh, Ali gives of the changes that Coleman uh, made to the poetry in order to accommodate it within the US environment is um, this bit of uh, poetry, um, uh, th this line of poetry out beyond ideas of, this is how it's translated, I, uh, out beyond ideas of right doing and wrong doing, there is a field, I will meet you there. Now, Ali's gloss of it, of the Arabic, of how the Arabic, um, um, kind of a close translation of the Arabic, is uh, he says that the highlighted bits um, originally were Iman and Kufr, and he glosses Iman as religion. For me, it's faith. In, in, you know, as a native speaker of Arabic, I understand Iman as faith, not any religion. 
and kufr is infidelity. Okay, so what Coleman did was replace right doing and wrong doing with iman and kufr, which are religious, sorry, replaced iman and kufr with right doing and wrong doing. And uh, Ali says that reading Rumi without the Quran is like reading Milton. So he suppressed the Quranic elements. He suppressed the Islamic elements. Reading Rumi without the, uh, without the Quran is like reading Milton without the Bible. Even if Rumi was heterodox, it's important to recognize that he was heterodox in a Muslim context and that Islamic culture centuries ago had room for such heterodoxy. So the, the, the Coleman's decision to suppress the Islamic elements in Rumi's poetry and to present him as a purely secular uh, poet with no connection to an Islamic tradition, a uh, Islamic upbringing. He was an Islamic scholar. He was not kind of parting ways with Islam. He was heterodox within an Islamic environment. That decision um, has implications not just for how you understand Rumi, but it also has implications for your attitude towards Islam and towards the Muslim community worldwide, even today. And so Ali says, imagine then a Muslim scholar saying that the, uh, I can't see the whole thing, that the basis for, of faith lies not in religious code, but in an elevated space of compassion and love. What we and perhaps many Muslim clerics might consider radical today is an interpretation that Rumi put forward more than 700 years ago. So in this process of selective appropriation, what Coleman has done is really suppress a particular dimension or characterization of Islamic communities, of Muslim communities, not only in the 13th century, because these kinds of um, um, omissions have implications for the way we also, our attitudes toward the Muslim community today. So uh, that kind of pattern of selective, uh, of, uh, selective appropriation has implica implication for the narrativization of Muslim communities today as well. <clears throat> okay, we move on to the third uh, dimension, another category, but remember these categories are uh, they 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 can't be uh, applied uh, individually i'm giving you examples individually but uh, when you have a complete text in front of you or a complete uh, interpreting encounter you you can't think in this compartmentalized way because the 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 sum total is always more than the individual parts as um, i will argue later so we come to another feature, which is relationality, which I said was the value that any individual item accrues within uh, a developing narrative by virtue of being constituted within that narrative. I'll give you an example again from my own research, uh, again on the Egyptian revolution. One of the other collectives that I uh, looked at, uh, apart from words of women from the Egyptian revolution, was called Musarin. Musarin were uh, filmmakers and subtitlers who uh, went around filming a material on the street in order to show people both home and abroad what was really going on that the media was suppressing. And in the course of uh, doing so, they talked to different people and different people said different things, again, different um, sectors of society. So I was looking at all these uh, videos which were on tube and trying to uh, find a way of making sense of what translation was doing in this context and with what implications. One thing I could not make sense of initially, uh, I didn't know what to do with apart from ignore it, is that I found quite a lot of errors like this. So here, for instance, the subtitle says, he heard about Khalid Said. Obviously, it's heard with a D, not with a T, but it's an error. It's a typographical error. And grammatical errors, like this one. If we had wanted to get to the ministry, we would have easily did it. It's just errors. And I thought, well, what do I do with this? Do I just say that they were unprofessional uh, subtitlers? They were bad subtitlers? Of course, it would just be... Uh, kind of silly really to do to, to come up with an analysis like this it's not it's not worth it and from thinking from a narrative perspective made me realize I think that these errors um, 
are not even worth correcting, actually, because you can, of course, on YouTube, you can go back and correct errors uh, fairly easily. Because these, uh, this subtitling was happening under extreme crisis situations. People typically, and they've, they've uh, explained this in um, an edited, the edited book that, uh, that I took, uh, brought, out, uh, brought out and that took the, um, got the intranews um, uh, award. They talked about the context in which they did the subtitling, and it was what they called crisis translations. They were typically themselves in the square uh, protesting, being shot at, being um, uh, dealing with uh, um, uh, thingy ga gas, I can't remember what it's called. Uh, and uh, they had to, they, they would come an assignment, they would see it on their, on their mobile phones and they would run back to their, wherever their digs were, quickly subtitle um, the, the latest video sent by the filmmakers and then run back to the square to participate in demonstrations. Under these conditions, you cannot produce perfect translations, right? I mean, nobody's going to stop to correct little typos. Well, what does that mean? Basically, uh, I've never come across anybody who's bothered about these errors. It's, it's not a problem. But I, I would go even further and say that the, the idea of a polished translation and the idea of an unpolished translation assume quite different values in different contexts. And this is not just uh, about translation. So to give you an example, a better example we're more used to, uh, when we see the kind of videos shot uh, on mobile phones that, uh, for example, a demonstration of Black Lives Matter or a tsunami or some kind of big crisis and people uh, shoot events on their mobile phones and they send them to um, the media and the media use that in reporting. And you see these uh, videos on your screen and they are shaken and they are grainy and they're not very clear and they uh, alternate between the ground and the person that they are uh, trying to capture, it doesn't bother you, does it? Doesn't You don't say, oh no, I can't uh, believe that, um, that narrative because look at the quality of the video being shot. Quite the opposite, actually. You think, oh, this is the real stuff. This is really how it happened. Uh, I would trust it a lot more than uh, a polished output of a big media outlet. And the same here, there is a sense in which you can trust these volunteer translators, subtitlers, this kind of reporting precisely because, not despite of the errors, but precisely because of the fact that it is not polished. It is not associated with big corporate business that can throw lots of money at uh, output like this in order to produce polished um, translations. And here, this, this is what I would call relationality in that polished, unpolished, expert, non-expert, professional, non-professional, assume quite different values in different contexts and to different constituencies. Okay, uh, I want to, fi uh, the final uh, example, uh, do I still have time, um, Shibaram? Do I still have time? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Uh um, okay, so I the the, the last uh, set of examples are uh, about um, both relationality and causal implotment, uh, and this is again from my own research. Ooh. No, no, no. Yeah. Okay. Right. <laughs> uh, this is um, uh, an organization that I've been interested in in for many many years. I've followed them almost since they started. It's an organization called uh, Middle East Media Research Institute. It is set up by, was set up by an ex-Israeli uh, intelligence officer. It's a Zion, very much a Zionist organization, although it presents itself as a research institute. So it calls itself Middle East Media Research Institute, uh, but it is a, a political lobby. Uh, their entire project revolves around producing a lot of translations so they go around um, collecting material from Arab, Iranian, other media, uh, even uh, recording uh, sermons in mosques and so on. And they, uh, they take all this material and they translate it into a whole range of languages, uh, but primarily English, of course, the most important is English. 
And uh, this material then is sent to uh, politicians in Congress, it's sent to uh, mainstream media and so on, who often make use of it and uh, you use it as a as a, you know proper journalistic data essentially. So uh, what is interesting? One of the main, uh, many interesting things. This is something I uh, analysis I published uh, in a paper that came out in Critical Studies on Terrorism. So what is interesting is that the About Us page of memory uh, has changed uh, over the years. So if you follow it chronologically, every few years. Uh, it changes in terms of the uh, source languages they decide to uh, translate from and the target languages they decide to translate into. Notice there is no uh, back and forth. So in terms of the directionality of translation, they never translate back from the total target languages into the source languages. They only go one way. There's a set of source languages they translate from, which changes now and again and a set of target languages that translate into, and these change again uh, as well. I have, I think, I hope you can see them. I have underlined in red the source languages. So in this first one that I actually captured the screenshot from, that was about 2002, uh, although I was following them before then, uh, these were, their source languages were Arabic, Persian, and Turkish and their target languages translated into were English, German, Hebrew, Italian, French, Spanish, and Japanese. Uh, few, a few uh, years later, their source languages were Arabic, Persian. Arabic and Persian, uh, or sometimes they call it Farsi, are the uh, kind of stable source languages. Urdu, Pashto, and Turkish, okay? And then uh, they were translating into English, French, Spanish, German, Italian, Polish, Russian, Chinese, Japanese, and Hebrew. Much more recently now, they are uh, translating uh, from Arabic. Now they call it Farsi, uh, Urdu, Pashto, Dari, and Turkish media into a much smaller set of languages, English, French, Polish, Japanese, Spanish, and Hebrew. Now we could, represent this in a tabular form like this. Uh, first of all, my narrative of this, what I'm the kind of narrative I'm teasing out of this is that this is a political lobby group uh, that is uh, very invested in Israel and the, um, and, and the US. I mean, that they're kind of strongly related. Uh, and they are weaving a narrative which is uh, very, very closely tied to the meta narrative of the war on terror. Um, and the source languages that they uh, choose to translate from are essentially depicting communities that are considered a threat to the peace of the entire world. And they have to be monitored. We have to listen in on what they say amongst each other. In fact, they say quite clearly in the in some of the reporting in uh, on their website that uh, you know what arabs and and iranians and so on say to each other what they tell us is very different from what they say uh, to each other when they don't think we're listening that's their kind of motto if you like so the source languages depict communities within this broader meta narrative of the war on terror communities and languages that have to be monitored because they pose a threat to us the free world us, the free world, is represented by target languages. These are the communities that have to do the monitoring because we have the responsibility of policing the world and keeping it safe. So the narrative goes. Now, any language, a language is just a language. If you look it up in the dictionary, it will give you a semantic uh, explanation. The language is just a language, but a language is also tied to a community. And within this particular uh, evolving narrative, the value of that uh, of that element of the narrative, the, the language, changes depending on how the narrative unfolds. So uh, I've highlighted some of the, there's a lot going on here, but some of the interesting things I will comment on is that, for instance, Turkish started out as a target language. Target language. Uh, back in 1999, Turkey was considered part of the Western civilized world, a part of us. 
But over the years, Turkey had be has become much more associated with Islamic ra radicalism, uh, with a, an Islamic uh, political system. And um, suddenly it kind of moved into being a source language, part of the communities we have to listen in on and, and monitor because they are a source of threat. Uh, and it stayed there to this, to this day. Another interesting one is Russian. Russian was again, it, Russian comes in and out, goes in and out of the target group. It, it, has, it hasn't yet moved into the source language group, but it goes in and out of the target group. Sometimes it's part of the civilized West that has to monitor the world and sometimes it isn't. Similarly with Chinese. Chinese of course didn't last very long uh, in that position because uh, as we know, um, the US uh, is, is kind of constructing it as the new uh, enemy uh, that has to be uh, monitored. But again, it hasn't quite moved into the source language yet. So this is, in, in, this, in this kind of scenario, uh, the way I am elaborating this narrative or making sense of it, is that this is a, a part of a meta-narrative or, or riding on the meta-narrative of the war on terror. It is, uh, there is a pattern of implotment here because the assumption is that you have uh, culpable communities that are responsible for all the unrest and, and terrorism in the world. Uh, and they, they are uh, identified by means uh, of their national languages. And you have a set of, co uh, a set of uh, communities, languages that are associated with those who are responsible for keeping the world safe. And within that context, then, if the if the target communities, the the the, uh, you, the Americans, the uh, British, the Germans, the Italians, and so on, if they invade one of those other communities and destroy it, they are merely defending themselves. That's the pattern of causal improvement. And the relationality is quite clear in terms of the value that is assigned to a particular language as a representative of a particular community. And that value changes depending on the changes of the unfolding narrative. This is not the only way that translation can be used to elaborate uh, a, narrative, a narrative through the choice of the languages to be translated uh, and the directionality of translation. So to give you a completely different example, which does the exact opposite of uh, memory, Babels, who are uh, a group of volunteer interpreters who have been um, um, offering volunteer interpreting in uh, social forums um, and identify with uh, values of uh, linguistic diversity and social justice. They have uh, on their website, uh, apart from the kind of uh, hello, bonjour, marhaban in many different languages on, on the same kind of level, uh, you go to their website and you see, for instance, I've highlighted in yellow the languages that they translate from and into. There's they, they basically that that's the interface, the site interface. Um, they, there's no, they don't go in one direction. It's not from a set of source languages to a set of target languages. The languages are all the same. You can take your pick depending on the language you speak. And they are listed not the way languages you would, would be listed on a commercial website where you would get English first, possibly followed, followed by French, then maybe Spanish, German, and so on. They are listed alphabetically and spelled out in the in their own language so catalan not catalan deutsch not german uh, the greek word for greek i suppose um, i can't pronounce it and so on uh, they're ordered alphabetically all um, no hierarchical ordering what is even more interesting uh, is if every time you go to the website that bit of highlighted in blue which is here in French, Babel, Babel's Etan, and my French is practically non-existent, so I won't try. But in, if, when it appears in English, it's, it basically tells you um, what Babel's is. It says Babel's is an international network of translators and interpreters, volunteer translators and interpreters who um, provide support to the social forum. Now, every time you 
go to the website, it depends on your luck, it, the, this will be done in a different language, so or will appear in a different language. So here, I don't even know what this language is, possibly Hungarian. Um, and the idea is that it performs diversity. It not only, it, not only does it tell you textually uh, a narrative of diversity, we stand for this, for that, we are here to support linguistic diversity, it actually performs that diversity as part of the narrative that it elaborates visually in terms of layout, in terms of choice of languages, in terms of the alternating windows of different languages that tell you what Babels is and so on. So uh, this is not um, um, a, single, uh, a single way of uh, narrating uh, the, the, the memory way. You can use uh, languages and the role of translation in many different complex ways. And it doesn't do to say, you know, I'm going to separate the categories, uh, the, type, the types of narrative uh, and the dimensions of narrative, and then look for them one by one and, um, and um, just list them because that won't do. Okay, so uh, to reiterate then, these features are not meant to be uh, coded and uh, listed or identified one at a time. Uh, and there's no assumption that they work independently of each other, as you can see in, in, the, in the case of uh, memory, for instance, they work together, you have to account for them together. And the analysis has to proceed by asking not how many instances of relationality or, or uh, selective appropriation there are, but what does each do and how does that contribute to the unfolding narrative. More specifically, to leave you with some kind of uh, pointers to how I would do narrative analysis anyway, whether you, we find that uh, doable or not from your perspective. Um, these are the kinds of questions that I would ask uh, of a set of data. How is this narrative constructed? Why is it constructed in this way, for instance? Why is memory choosing those particular source languages? Why do the source languages and target languages change? Um, why is it in one direction only? How does that fit into some overall narrative that it's trying to elaborate. How do I, as an analyst, come to the conclusion that this is what memory is doing? Because, so I go, I, I go back and I dissect my own uh, process of making sense of the data. In the, in the same way that actually, you know, when, you, when people tell you stories, you don't stop to say, ah, before I can make sense of this, I've got to make a list of the uh, what I see as selective appropriation and what they've just told me or whatever, you get an overall impression. You you make sense naturally, um, um, totally spontaneously, but you can then reflect on that and say, well, where did I get that impression from? Why do I understand it in that way? Was I wrong to understand it in that way? Maybe I'll look at it again and see uh, and and see what it means to somebody else as well. Okay, what feature of the text or interaction gave, gave, gave rise to this understanding? What made me think so? Does the time and space within which I received the text contribute to this understanding? Would I have made sense of it in the same way if I'd come across it 20 or 30 years ago or somewhere else? Yeah. In fact, we, we revisit a lot of uh, narratives like novels and so on. Um, uh, in fact, there's a, a very well-known uh, narrative now, I, I can't remember the name of the novel, but it was unheard of before or, or not very well known before. And since the pandemic, everybody's talking about it because they say it predicts um, the, the pandemic we're experiencing now. So you think, I, I, I just read The Plague again, actually, Camus' Plague, um, and, and you, you make more sense of it when you've your experiences have changed when your view of the world has changed. So the temporal point at which you're making sense of a narrative is also important. What is the meaning or value of any item in the narrative, in this particular narrative world? Not what I think it means semantically, not what the dictionary tells me it means. What value is it accruing in this particular context? To summarize the main points I try to make and then I'll leave you in peace that narrative isn't tied to a particular textual format or genre, okay? That uh, narrative analysis uh, doesn't proceed 
uh, by mapping categories onto textual or visual or any other kind of data that sum is always greater than its parts. It's a feature of life and how we make sense of life, not just narrative. A narrative analysis seeks to offer an interpretation of how a narrative is constructed and with what implications. You also have to reflect on your own values as you do this exercise that the interpretation itself is embedded in the narrative world in which that it tries to eliminate. That means that you have to look at your own values. Why am I getting this impression? Why am I uh, interpreting it in this way? Somebody else might interpret it in a different way. And you cannot escape your own embeddedness in the narrative world. Um, this has implications for what you choose to do research on. If you choose data and the code of old ways people used to come to me and to do a phd and say will you recommend some novel or something i can i can um, analyze uh, to do a phd on and that is completely wrong uh, attitude to research anyway but it's also wrong from a narrative theory perspective because if that doesn't if you don't engage with it if it doesn't mean anything to you if you don't have particular insights into the period in which it's set into the the, the, the kind of politics that are, that are going on, then you're not going to be able to make sense of it. Okay, so um, that is, uh, these are the main lessons I hope I've managed to communicate to you. And I will leave you with um, some references that you might find useful. All the references that I mentioned here, of course, there's a lot more on narrative theory uh, in translation, but uh, these are the ones that I mentioned here so that you can trace them if you want. Okay. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, we are extremely grateful to you for the detailed overview of social narrative theory and uh, some of its applications in translation and interpreting studies, uh, beginning with an account of the theory's basic assumptions. I'm sure that this talk will help us to apply narrative theory in the context of existing research uh in in the translation studies as well as interpretation studies and i am sure that it will definitely open up newer possibilities and alternative ways to read and study translation interpretation thank you uh, with that ma'am may i uh, start the question answer session because i have already received uh, so many questions from different okay. parts of the world okay, I'll do my best. Uh, uh, okay. Okay, Professor Daniel Cruz from Federal University of Alagoas at uh, Masinho, Brazil. Uh, okay. He has asked you, uh, dear Professor Mona Baker, narrative has all to do with history. So could you comment on narrative analysis in translation regarding a current tendency in some countries such as brazil at the moment where the federal government and its followers disseminate narratives in order to rewrite history in favor of dictatorship and against widely accepted narratives in favor of environment protection okay I'm trying to uh, to get the view of the screen that has the chat in it, but uh, no, you can stop uh, screen sharing so that we can. I, I, I stopped full, it. Full view. Can you stop the screen sharing for me? No, I no, think it stopped. Uh, are you still seeing the screen? Yeah, references are seen here. Uh, stop share. Yeah. Okay. 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 Got it. Now I've stopped it. Right. And now I yeah, can also. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Right. Apologies for being so bad with technology. <laughs> Must be my age. Okay. Um, uh, of course, it's a, it's a very uh, good and interesting question. And I think it's one of the um, areas of appeal for narrative theory for me is that whenever uh, you talk about it, uh, um, in, people always think of what is happening around them because it has ap direct applications to what they're actually experiencing. As far as history is concerned, of course, this is happening all over the world, always has happened. History is always written by the victorious, as they say. 
Uh, and that is why you always have um, alternative histories, um, underground histories. Uh, and that is the, that, that's the dynamic of power that we have to deal with um, every day. And, and it's not no different for history with a big H, if you like, uh, than from our individual history. So if you, if you come into uh, under attack for whatever reason, uh, in a big way, and I have kind of historically, uh, your own story, your own account of your actions will be rewritten by powerful institutions, by powerful media. And it's not just big histories, it's even our individual histories. And that is the dynamic of power. All you can do is find other ways in which you can record events as you witness them uh, from different points of view, as for example, the Mussarine group that I mentioned in Egypt, uh, who were, who had, I mean, a huge number of hours, I think sp very specifically 858 uh, hours of video recording of events uh, on the streets in Egypt uh, during the revolution. Uh, they have uh, produced an archive of those recordings that is available on, uh, on the web in order precisely to challenge the mainstream media and the main mainstream histories that are being rewritten now, uh, which, are, which are of course producing a completely different view of the history of the revolution from the one that they experienced and documented. So that is also available. The problem is, uh, uh, the problem is that it's not taught in schools. It's again, it's a question of dynamic and power. Uh, it's not taught in schools, um, it's not uh, prominent in the media, you have to find a way of knowing about it, you have to know that it exists in order to uh, have access to it. And there's very little we can do apart from that at the moment, unless you, I don't, I don't know what you do to change it, because that's the way history works, always has worked, the powerful always rewrite history in their own way, um, and the less powerful find other ways of recording that history until such time as uh, people in a different era perhaps can dig up these alternative uh, histories and, and make them available to more people. I, it's not a very satisfying answer, but it's, it's a real world problem, not a theoretical problem, I think. <laughs> Thank you, ma'am. Uh, the next one is from Dr. E. Tian from Queen's University Belfast. Uh, dear Professor Becker, in your early edition of the book, Translation and Conflict, you used the term repositioning of participants. And now it seems you are talking about relationality. May I ask what is the rationale behind this change of term? Uh, if so, I can't hear you. Rindan? Uh, Ma'am, am I can, audible now? Can you can you repeat that? I I lost you. Yeah, yes. I lost sound for okay. me. Uh, okay, ma'am. Uh, after uh, repositioning uh, of participants, yeah. Why why did I change uh, from? Uh, uh, okay, ma'am. Uh, I'm repeating the dear Professor yeah. Baker. In your early edition of the book Translation and Conflict, used the term repositioning of participants. And now it seems you are talking about relationality. May I ask what is the rationale behind this change of term? Yeah. Uh, okay. I don't think that it is a change in, in, uh, in term uh, because in the translation on conflict book, as I also have a whole section on relationality. So it's not a change in term. Uh, this was a kind of supplementary way of uh, looking at narratives by looking at the way in which they're framed. Um, these are kind of different tools. Uh, I'm, I'm really, I was never after um, producing a watertight um, theory where every bit kind of um, coheres in a straightforward way with every other bit. I, I, what, I'm, what I was after in writing this book is providing different vantage points, so different ways of looking at a set of data and um, teasing out implications from it. So that repositioning of participants was in the chapter on framing. 
it was not presented as a dimension of, of narrative. Um, but I'm not really not bothered about what you call it, whether you call it framing or because ultimately, as I've explained in other publications, the borderline between narratives and frames is also very, very uh, fuzzy uh, because a frame serves as a narrative in its own right. So the uh, cover of gender in translation that I shared with you, that would be accounted for possibly initially as a frame, a way of framing the text so that before you enter into the text proper, it's a paratext, uh, it tells you how to interpret the text. I know from looking at that uh, frame, what kind of attitude Sherry Simon is going to be elaborating. And she thinks that patri patriarchy is um, dominant in society because of the layout and distribution of course. Now that is a frame. At the same time, of course, it is a narrative in its own right. And I'm not really invested in drawing clear boundaries between concepts that I'm using as ultimately as heuristic devices to make sense of the world, to make sense of a piece of data. But without necessarily, I mean, I'm, I keep saying throughout uh, the presentation that they, these are just, they don't work separately. They are not totally separate from each other. They, there's a lot of overlap and they are not categories or tools that you just list on a page and, and look for examples of. They are simply ways in which you can um, talk about the sense that you've already made of a text in a way. Um, retrace your steps in how you made sense of it. So there is overlap, yes, but at least in Translation and Conflict, I was presenting that um, as, a, as, a, as something under framing, whether I'm just trying to think on my feet, whether you could talk about the distribution of languages in the memory narrative as repositioning of participants. Yes, I suppose you can, you can do that. But I was trying to also link it to causal implotment and so on, but you can, yeah. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, the next one is uh, from Professor, uh, uh, just a second, huh? Professor Basak Ergil uh, from the Department of Translation and Interpreting, Istanbul Yeni Uzil University, and she has posted a longish question. Thank you for your talk, Professor Baker. I would like to come up with a question on the relation of narrative analysis with translation criticism. In my published book chapter entitled, Re-Narrating the Present, Activist Translation Blogging as an Act of Translation Criticism in a Globalizing Era, I argued that narrative theory can be used as a methodological tool to carry out translation ethics and translation criticism practices. I argued that translations and retranslations are narrations and re-narrations of source texts and are likely to act as criticisms of mainstream submissive translations. You do agree with this argument and do you think narrative approach to translation can be used beyond merely to provide a critical outlook and be offered directly as a method of translation criticism? Uh, thank you, it's a very interesting suggestion, but it's not one that I thought about and it's difficult to think about it uh, on your feet. Definitely narrative analysis has an ethical, strong ethical dimension, ethical, whether it's not the same as translation criticism. Uh, and depends on what you mean by translation criticism, but definitely narrative uh, theory assumes that the, the point of any narrative is always, there is a moral there. Even if it's a moral about um, doing the right thing scientifically, producing uh, a good scholarly work, whatever it is, the story that you're telling, you're telling it because you want to, give a message to somebody 
um, unless it's just passing the time of day, you know, like what they call um, fatic uh, communication. Um, and so uh, there's always an ethical, there is always ethical import, but what that has to do with translation criticism specifically, I'm not sure. I, I can't really venture an opinion without reading your work or, or, uh, or, or understanding more about it. Thank you, ma'am. The next one is from uh, Yasir Said. Uh, he is doing MA in Translation Studies, Faculty of Languages, Shohag University. And uh, the question is, uh, I have two questions, if you please. Is the narrative theory an appropriate tool for analyzing poetry in translation? Or is it more appropriate for analyzing political discourse? And the second one, on the other side to analyze narratives in or through translation, can we study or analyze narrative about translation and translation studies? Right, uh, the second, uh, the first one about poetry and uh, non-political material, I think I've already um, uh, showed that, but with the example of uh, Rumi's poetry, for example, and and um, Kondera's novel, for instance, is not political. Uh, as far as narrative series concerned, everything is political, really, uh, in the end. Uh, science is political, everything is political. But, but certainly, I've, I've already given you an example of poetry. I see no, no reason at all why you can't apply narrative theory to poetry. The second example was, uh, the second question uh, was, um, can't remember now, what was it? Uh, just a second, ma'am. Uh, on the other side, to analyze narratives in or through translation, oh, yeah. Yeah. Can we study or analyze narratives about translation and translation studies? Yes, absolutely. And uh, I've done that myself. In fact, one of the first papers I published about narrative in 2005 was uh, titled Narratives in and of Translation. And it was precisely about that and tried to analyze um, narratives such as the bridge narrative. Uh, for example, the idea that translation is a bridge between culture and, and so on. So, yes, of course you can. Uh, Ma'am, the next one is from Professor Sharmila Jajoria from Junjunwala College, Bombay, India. Uh, she has asked you, as stories told on the same facts are never the same, how much does translation affect the interpretation from readers' point of view, as it is also an intercultural process for the translator as well as the reader who might not have who might not have read the original text. Yeah, I think that goes without saying in narrative theory. Um, even the same translator uh, translating the same text twice is going to have slightly different interpretations um, and, and the same reader reading the same text twice. As, as I said, I just read Camus' The Plague again and I understood it in quite a different way. Life has moved on, my experiences have changed. Uh, and that, is, that applies also to the translator and to the reader of the translation, the same translation. I read Camus in translation, same translation I read many years ago as a student and I understood it in a different way. And if I was translating it, I would also understand it in a different way. And that would influence the way in which uh, the reader would, uh, what, what they would get out of the translation. So, I mean, that goes without saying in narrative theory, I think. Thank you, ma'am. The next one is from Dr. Lay of, you know, from Queen's University, Belfast. Uh, he has asked the sentence, quote, we would have easily did it, unquote. If the mistake is made by the source text producer, do translators have the responsibility 
to correct it in the production of the target text? Well, in, the, in this case, it can't have been made by the source text producer because the source text producer was speaking in Arabic, not in English. And this is a subtitle of the Arabic. So here it doesn't apply at all, really. Uh, but otherwise, uh, I really, narrative theory just, uh, maybe that is a, a, a shortcoming of narrative theory, but narrative theory really cannot cope with uh, or can't provide answers for questions in the abstract. Uh, it depends on what text, um, what translator, what kind of error. Uh, I just can't, it just, it, it doesn't lend itself to these kinds of abstract rules uh, or rules in general, really. Uh, and ultimately the way you translate has, as I said, ethical import. And that depends on your own values as well. And what you think of is ethical or unethical. You can actually make, um, opposing um, cases, opposing um, arguments for doing either of these things. And uh, the, the last chapter of translation and conflict, which I'm um, kind of revisiting now at the moment, uh, provides a, a discussion of the narrative paradigm, Walter Fisher's narrative paradigm, which is precisely about assessing narratives about the fact that the same narrative can be assessed in very different ways by two very different people reaching very different, equally ethical um, decisions um, because they reflect their own values. So it's not something in necessarily in the narrative itself. It's what I might think of as an error that has to be corrected in a text that I'm translating. What kind of error? Why do I think it has to be corrected? Maybe something that you think is minor or you shouldn't interfere with. What is interesting is not your decision or mine, but how we arrive at those decisions and what they reflect about our values, uh, our individual values, and with what implications. Okay. Uh, Dr. Muhammad Ali from University of Hyderabad asked you, how would you relate this power structure being operated in translation to a neutral plane, which meanings claim to possess in communication? A neutral plane, which what? Which meanings claim to possess in communication? I think everything I said, uh, I hope uh, I said it clearly. Uh, militates against this, against this kind of view at all. There is no such thing as neutrality from a narrative perspective. Um, there's no such thing as objectivity. There is integrity. Integrity is different from objectivity. Uh, but you cannot, but neutral in what sense? I mean, I, I, I just, uh, I can't cope with the <laughs> issue of neutrality, the concept of neutrality in any context really, because uh, there's no, I mean, even, even leaving things as they are is not neutral. It's in action, but it's not neutral. Okay. Uh, Ma'am, the next one is from Professor Fenty Kushumastuti from UNS Indonesia. Mm -hmm. And uh, she has written, thank you for the enlightening lecture, Professor Mona Baker. From the examples that you provided, I can see that there are so many things influence the way a translator translating a narrative text, such as the ideological aspects and cultural issues, or perhaps the decisions of the editors or commissioners. My question is, how far can a translator go to suppress the translation work that may give a huge impact on the target culture? Why, why would they want to suppress it? I'm, I'm not sure I understand. Sorry. Oh, are you? Are you uh... Yeah, I'm, I'm not clear what what is meant by suppress the translation work. 
if you mean by intervene yeah if you mean by intervene to what extent and the translator can intervene uh, because of implications for the target culture i think different translators do it in different ways um, some translators uh, intervene not in the text itself but in the paratext and um, some of the things i analyzed in other publications um, there's one in social semiotics uh, which looked at the translations of uh, samuel huntington's um, um, the clash of civilizations uh, into Arabic, and there were two translations. And, and this is a, a book that is extremely, extremely offensive and had terrible implications for the Arab and Islamic world, uh, but it is translated. It's translated and translated closely, but the translators uh, add a, a lengthy introduction, uh, rebutting the, the main arguments of the book. And they have a lot of footnotes in order to rebut individual points that the author is making. So this is one way in which, uh, and, the, and their argument on the back cover is that although it is very offensive to Arab and Islamic culture, this book has to be read because people have to understand what is, what is the, the, the kind of uh, uh, argument behind um, some of the things that they are experiencing the negative um, impacts of. I don't know if this answers your question, but okay, ma'am. The next one. I'm sure. I'm sure. Professor Pete is listening to us. No. Um, no. Ma'am, the next one is from Pratibedi, and uh, he has asked you how. Uh, how is it that everyone wants to read Rumi with or without the Quran, but no, no one wants to read Milton? <laughs> uh it's it's the dynamics of power again what uh, what gets translated in what way and uh, how much it accommodates the expectations uh, and the prejudices often of uh, the target culture um i can't comment on that it is it's uh, you if you if you want them to read something else you've got to make an effort to provide it to provide translations of it to uh, uh, market it uh, popularize it in why i don't mean popularize it by by um, adopting domesticating strategies i mean find ways of uh, making it available and uh, and and encouraging people to read it you're still not going to compete as much with the big publishers, of course, and the big publishers aren't necessarily going to agree to, to uh, publish um, these translations. And so, again, you're locked up in the usual dynamic of power, which is not restricted to uh, narrative theory, not restricted to translation, not restricted to a particular language. And, and it's the dynamic we all live within and try to uh, negotiate on a daily basis. Ma'am, uh, Dr. Rana Roshdi, PhD researcher at uh, Dublin City University. Uh, she has asked you, uh, Professor Mona Baker, thank you for the very insightful presentation. Do you think that the translator of Rumi's work made the decision to suppress Islamic references due to norms related to production and reception at the time? Um, well, I don't have any access to the translator or their intentions, but it would seem plausible. I imagine the accommodating the text, making it popular. It's, uh, okay. Would prefer secular a secular poet. Okay, uh, ma'am, uh, Professor Tanzil Ansari, uh, he has asked, you know, as you talked about the Arabic interview of Egyptian women, which was translated in different languages. Could you please tell us with an example how it has changed after translation? 
and how did it function in different societies? Uh, I, d I don't think this is possible to answer because it's too broad a question. First of all, I, I, I have no means of knowing how it was received in different societies. Uh, I didn't do this kind of um, analysis. I could have, I suppose, uh, interviewed people who watched the videos in, in different countries, but I didn't do that and I didn't have the means to do that. Uh, my uh, research was based on interviewing the filmmakers, interviewing the subtitlers, and analyzing some of the actual uh, videos in the languages that I uh, have direct access to, then that's English and Arabic. Uh, and some, uh, some kind of broader observations on languages like Spanish, where I could see things like code switching disappearing, where I could see other things I've, rep I've reported on. So I think I'm not in a position to, uh, to answer your question uh, because I didn't um, do reception studies. I didn't uh, interview um, people or look at, for example, uh, reviews of these uh, videos in, um, in the various languages in which they were uh, translated. Uh, the next one is from Dr. Imran Khan from India. Uh, he has asked you, dear Professor Baker, translation is more about transcreation, and that is crucial. Narrative is more inclined to particular culture. Islam, for example, does not give the very idea of jihad in Quran. Having said so, how do you, as a translator, see the Islamic narration of actual jihad as rightly mentioned in Holy Quran. Do you agree that mere translation does not suffice here? Contextualization is more needed and that must happen for common people? Um, question and I'm not sure and I'm, I'm in a position to answer it really. Um, and, and specifically about uh, Islam, but there are different views in which, uh, about uh, irrespective of narrative theory, there are different views about how you deal with the kind of misunderstanding or, or willful, what I call willful misunderstanding that goes on in relation to Islam and Muslim communities. Um, I remember, for instance, uh, a discussion I had with um, Ahdef Suwaif, a very well-known Arab novelist, about the problem with the term jihad and in some of the translations that I, uh, and martyrdom, uh, ma you know, sh sh shahada, uh, martyrdom, or shaheed, martyr. And some of the translations, um, not, not from the Egyptian revolution uh, context and from other contexts that I uh, had looked at, uh, suppressed these references replaced, um, he was martyred, for instance, by he was killed, and so on. And I was, I, I was saying that this is, this is done more, looks like it's done systematically in order to reduce the amount of what would appear to be uh, Islamic uh, references in a text that is trying to reach audience uh, in somewhere like the US that are uh, have a particular negative view of Islam. Um, and I remember Ahdaf Suwaif arguing that we shouldn't suppress these references. We shouldn't even gloss them. We should, uh, her view was, we should uh, claim ownership of our own vocabulary and not allow it to be suppressed or given new meanings by others. So she was saying she wouldn't suppress the term jihad she would use it the way it is used in Islam properly. Same with shahada, martyrdom. In fact, in I, I know in Egypt where I come from, the Arab world, uh, anyone who's uh, uh, killed either in, even sometimes in an accident, but certainly illegally in, in conflict zones and so on, is referred to as a shaheed even when they're Christian. Even the Christians call, call them shaheed. So it's, it's, it's even broader than Islam as such. But of course, these, and that's, that's, the, that's the problem of relation, relationality, these 
items accrue different values and different meanings in a broader narrative of Islam that is circulating uh, and being circulated aggressively and actively all, all around the world. This is what you're up against, but how you negotiate it, as I said, different people have, have different uh, views. Uh, contextualizing, yes, I agree, but you can't always contextualize. You don't always have the space to concept, contextualize. So the example I, get, I, I was talking about where references to martyrdom and uh, martyrs, uh, shaheed, shohada, uh, was, were watered down quite significantly. This was uh, a subtitled film, a subtitled documentary film of the destruction of a camp in, in Gaza and occupied territories. Uh, the, the, so within the context of a set of subtitles in a film where you have to hold the attention of the viewer uh, and, and get a message across to them that this is happening and this is not right, you can't really add footnotes. You can't, uh, you, you have very limited space for the subtitles. So you can't really, there's very little you can do in terms of contextualization. Um, and so you have, you have a lot of elements to balance, uh, including the space that is available to the translation, the kind of audience you're trying to reach and how much they can um, um, understand of, of the message. Uh, th there's a, there's a lot going on here that you that you would need to to consider. It's not a simple answer, I'm afraid. Uh, Ma'am, just you know, uh, reference you know, uh, there is a word called shohid in Bengali and shahid. And we use this word irrespective of the religion. Oh, yeah. Martyrs, you know, Muslim martyrs. So we also use this word shohid. Uh, okay, ma'am. Uh, the next one is from Beihu uh, from Melbourne University, Australia. Uh, she has written, thank you, Professor Baker. My question is, as researchers, we might interpret the data in a rather subjective way. So how can we ensure that we are not unconsciously manipulate the results? That is how to demonstrate reflexibility in research. Yeah, uh, as I said, uh, I think um, if you if you were in the chat in the room when um, the meeting room when I explained this, uh, there is no objectivity in narrative theory, and this is now. Um, and uh, even outside narrative theory, this is actually accepted in even in the hard sciences now, that there's no such thing as objectivity in research or in life. There is integrity, okay? So integrity is quite different from uh, objectivity. So if you certainly, if you're using narrative theory, you have to start with the assumption that you are subject, that you cannot take yourself out of the narrative in which you you and the material that you are analyzing are embedded. That doesn't mean you do it irresponsibly. It means you have to be extra careful, uh, reflect on your own values. So when I said you, you, you do narrative analysis in translation almost the way you do it when you make sense of what people tell you in the world, of course you are not uh, objective. When people tell me a story, I agree with something, I don't agree with other things, I feel strongly about their point of view in one way or another. But if I'm a responsible human being, I also try as much as humanly possible to see things from their point of view, to make allowances for the fact that they have a different background, that they've had a different experience of life, that there may be other ways in which they are seeing this, and you do the same in research. You say, this is how I make sense of it. This is, uh, this is what I understand uh, of the data. This is how I would analyze it. But maybe somebody else can analyze it in a different way, equally valid, possibly. But this is what I'm proposing as support for my analysis. It may be plausible to you. It may not be plausible to you, but let's talk about it and we see Maybe there's a different way of seeing it. This is just life, it's not just research, but the idea that you are going to 
go into a set of data completely cold without any views, without uh, without bringing your views to bear at all on it, is just an illusion. It's uh, and the sooner we get rid of that illusion, the better in in translation studies, really, because I think that the more blind spots you have, the more dangerous you are. You are you do more damage when you're not aware of your own um, values than when you uh, and and when you when you believe that you are totally neutral and objective because nobody is. You do more damage than when you take a point of view, but you are aware of it and you are prepared to support it with, uh, with uh, evidence from whatever you're dealing with and take responsibility for that interpretation. Ma'am, this one is the last uh, from Dr. Tanzil Ansari. Uh, she uh, you know, as you talked about Arabic interview of Egyptian women, which was translated in different languages. Could you please tell us with an example how it has changed after translation, and how did it function in different society? Uh, this I think I've I've already answered this yeah, one. Okay, yeah, please. I think there is a repetition. You know, oh, sorry, sorry, ma'am. Yeah. 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 Uh, okay, ma'am. I I don't think there is any more. Yes, I I I would request a uh, particular to give the vote thanks. I see a lot of chats. Uh, chats. I don't know if I'm supposed to do anything with them. Mm -hmm. yeah. Ma'am, I have I have you know read out all the postings okay. out there. Um, thank you, Mona Baker, for that uh, wonderful afternoon. Uh, there are we are getting a lot of responses from uh, you know our participants. Someone says thank you, Mona Baker, for insightful ta talk and the discussion that followed. Highly comprehensive and resourceful session. Thanks so much, Professor Mona Baker, for insightful thank and discussions. Great session, well done, uh, and so on and so forth. Okay. Um, it is, um, in my own opinion, a very productive and insightful, um, you know, revisiting of your own books, Translation and Conflict, and uh, also, uh, you know, translating uh, dissent. And um, I am very grateful for that. Uh, we all enjoyed every minute of that marvelous lecture. Thank On you. behalf of Sri Sri University and University of Hyderabad, I thank you for that wonderful lecture and wonderful evening. Thank you. Thank, thank I you very thank much. Thank all you, the participants. I, I thank all the participants and um, those people, all, 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 all participants who have asked questions and made this session very lively. And also I thank all the organizers of Sri Sri University and the technical staff for their support. Thank you one and all. Thank you. Our thank next you. lecture will be, yeah. Our next lecture would be on um, <clears throat> uh, 15th Thursday 3.30 p.m. afternoon by Professor Uday Kumar from Department of English, uh, Jawaharlal Nehru University, New Delhi. I welcome all of you to that lecture also. Thank you, Mona. Thank you. Thank you very much. Bye -bye. Thank you, ma'am. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye -bye. Thank you.